The year is 1995 and Jason and Timmy are friends at school. Jason's father is an international business executive and always buys the latest and greatest, even down to custom components sometimes. Timmy's father is a school teacher and he's managed to skimp and save from his meagre allowance to buy a 48640 machine from the tip shop. Legend has it that it was owned by an old man who died at the keyboard and if you listen late at night you can hear him tapping away. Tap, tap, tap. Jason's machine has the latest brand name Asus motherboard PCI 1486SP3G with an Intel 420ZX Saturn 2 chipset. It's a PCI socket 3 board and it wouldn't even fit into Timmy's machine. Timmy's also managed to get himself a 486 socket 3 board. It's got a UMC 8886F chipset on it. He bought it second hand from a friend and it didn't support 3.5 volt chips when he got it, but his father is an electronics ace since he teaches electronics at the local high school and so he's installed a voltage regulator so that it can run the later 3.5 volt chips. Timmy's managed to get an AMD DX4100 chip working on his machine at 100 megahertz, but Jason has a little bit of an emergency on his hands. No one's really quite sure how it happened, but whilst Jason's father was overseas on a business trip, the school bully managed to already get hold of a Pentium 120 machine. So to tide himself over through this obviously very difficult period, Jason's managed to buy an AMD 5x86 at 133 MHz. He's pretty sure it'll work on his fancy Asus motherboard, but he also wants to let Timmy try it out on his no-name Taiwanese brand board to see if it works there. Well, Jason's father never made it back from the business trip and it took a further two years for the life insurance company to even decide whether sake drinking competition was covered under the policy. Jason and Timmy remained good friends at school and in 1996 when id Software released their new game Quake, they decided to take their machines head to head once again to see which was better. Through the advantages of time travel, we've managed to get hold of the board from Timmy's machine and the board from Jason's machine, and we've already reviewed Timmy's board on the channel before, overclocking the AMD 5x86133 to the max. There's a link to the video above where we get a channel record of 16.8 frames per second in Quake. But it's about time that we reviewed Jason's board with its fancy Intel Saturn II chipset. And don't worry, we'll get the boards back before the boys even notice that they're missing. Well, I've set everything up on the edge of the bench with my ET6000 PCI video card just for consistency with all the prior results on the channel. Well, it's time to switch this thing on and see whether it even boots up. The fan is spinning on the CPU and the hard drive sounds like it's spinning up and seeking. So maybe this is going to work, but I don't see anything on the screen. Have we got a jumper setting incorrect maybe? The motherboard manual still seems to be on the Asus website. And yeah, it's PCI-I, not PCI-1, like I thought earlier. The main thing with this board is it seems to have an onboard PCI SCSI controller. And if I scroll down through the manual, it seems like it only supports a frontside bus speed of 25 and 33 MHz. Now that could be a bit of a problem when we come to try and overclock the 5x86 a little bit later. Well, at least we can set the multiplier. To get four times, we need to set the board to two times. Now, I don't know why there's writing in pen on the official Asus document on their website. There are a number of CPUs explicitly mentioned, but not the 5x86. But I have found on other websites that this board does definitely support that CPU. <laughs> Look, there's more writing in pen on this page as well. I've had no luck getting this to boot up with the 5x86, and I'm beginning to think it needs a BIOS update for that. So I'm going to put an Intel 486DX4100 in and see if I can get that to boot. Well, apparently I found the problem. It doesn't support Edo RAM. So, so much for being a high-end board. Anyway, it does boot up with the DX4100, so that's great news. While we're here, let's go into the BIOS and see if there's any interesting options to play with. It does look like there's a DRAM and cache wait state setting, but they're both on zero already. There's a few other things to fiddle with, but uh, not very much. So let's just boot this and try and get a baseline score for the DX4100. Well, interestingly enough, it didn't like my Connor CFS1081A hard drive. This is around one gigabyte and is what I normally use for benchmarking on the channel, but it didn't even see that there was a drive there. 
So I switched over to this Connor drive. It's a CP30254, and it's much smaller. It's 212 megabytes. I guess we just have to put up with that unless we try out the SCSI option on the board. Well, let's run a Superscape benchmark. I had a viewer who said that he was getting much higher scores than me, something like 150. I've never seen it go that high on a 486, so I just want to see what happens here. Yeah, 67.1 is actually pretty low. Uh, so I think this benchmark can give unreliable scores at times. I'm also running a PC player benchmark at standard resolution. Should expect 20 or so. Well, we're getting 18.3. So again, a little on the low side here. Well, that's interesting. The Doom benchmark crashes. I don't see any reason Doom shouldn't run on this machine. Well, that is an unusual problem. The memory hole address in the BIOS settings was 100 followed by five zeros. And I changed it to OFO followed by five zeros. And now it works. Really crazy. But no Quake time demo. It just says OMPT cannot open. Well, I have to look that up as well and see what that might be. Well, that was an easy one to fix. Quake just doesn't like being run from a zip drive. So I just copied it to the hard drive. But let's see what score we get on this DX4100. And 11 frames a second to be nice. And we get 10.9, which is okay actually. So let's try and get the AMD 5x86 working at 133 megahertz. So it should just be a matter of switching the CPU over. And of course, I also have to change the multiplier now to two. And then I might have to change the settings for the CPU itself. It's not clear. There aren't very many settings on this board. So let's change it to a multiplier of two first of all, and we'll see if that works, and then we'll go from there. Switching on, let's see if it works, at all the right sounds, and it even says 133 megahertz, which is good. So let's check out the cache and see whether it's right back or right through. So for this, I'll run CPU check, and it tells us that it's currently in right through mode. So I'm going to try setting this up as a P24D CPU and see if that triggers the write back. And that seems to have been successful. So let's do another Quake benchmark. Well, that ran as slow as a dog. A couple of minutes just to load Quake from disk. So I fiddled around again to find the jumper for the write back cache and eventually managed to figure it out. The rest of the settings are the same as a 486. And now I have a score of 13 frames a second. Well, it's still a long way short of 16.8, but of course we haven't managed to overclock the CPU yet. So let's see if we can find any jumper settings that'll let us change the front side bus. There's just two jumpers here that we can fiddle with. It looks like there's one on the board that's kind of hardwired. So we can stick these on either end of this set of jumpers, or we can take them off altogether. So let's just try all the combinations. Well, after trying all the possible settings, it seems like I only ever get 133 or 100 megahertz. Without a third jumper for the multiplier, I can't get any more out of this board. But there is one other thing that I want to try. Some of my viewers have been saying that the reason that I haven't been able to get my CPU to start up at a really high frequency is because of the external cache. And I should try turning that off and maybe some of the other boards will allow me to get an even higher score with this CPU. It turns out that the best board to do our experiments on is the small Taiwanese board that I showed at the beginning of the video on which we got the channel record of 16.8 frames per second. And the reason is that there's a whole load of settings here that we can use to exclude various things from consideration. So first of all, I can turn off the external cache entirely and I've done some experiments just to verify that this really does turn the cache off. So now the cache is completely out of consideration. I can also turn off the CPU internal cache just in case that's an issue. Of course, I'm not going for benchmark scores here. I'm just trying to see which parts of the system are responsible for it not starting up at a front side bus of 60. So now I can actually turn off uh, the auto configuration, and there's a whole lot of options here. The first one is the host to PCI clock ratio, and if I set that to one half, then the PCI card will actually be running at 30 megahertz instead of 60, 
And so this means that we can use practically any video card that we want here. The video card is then out of consideration and we don't need to worry about that. Uh, there's also a wait state here for the host to PCI post write. I don't think that this is important, but uh, I could set that to one. And there's various other options here I could disable as well. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that too much. I can also increase the I.O. recovery time here. Uh, again, I don't think this actually affects anything, but let's put it right up. Now, uh, a really important one is the ISA bus uh, speed. Now, it's not going to be an issue here because it's taking this from the PCI clock, but uh, let's just set that to a very low frequency so that the ISA bus is out of consideration. In fact, I've already determined that the main thing that we're going to have a problem with here is the hard drive booting. Since I'm running the hard drive from an ISA controller card since there's no uh, hard drive controller on board. And as, so long as the drive boots, there's no other issues that are going to come from this. Uh, so I really don't need to fiddle with this, but just to be absolutely sure, I'm gonna set this to PCI clock on four. So it really isn't going to be a consideration anymore. Uh, the other thing I have to do is to change the wait states on the DRAM to the highest possible values. Now this won't actually eliminate DRAM from consideration. It still could be an issue, but uh, this gives us our greatest chance of starting the machine at 180 megahertz with a front side bus of 60. And I also have some interesting RAM chips to try. These are the chips that I have that I can use with this board. There's a pile of 70 nanosecond stuff here, some of which is really quite good. There's some 60 nanosecond chips and also some 50s. Now we wouldn't expect all of the 70s to work at even 50 megahertz front side bus. And I can go through and eliminate the ones that don't work at 50. They're certainly not going to work at 60. But uh, even these chips may not work at 50 if the weight states are set too low. So that's the purpose of setting those as high as possible, so that these actually have a chance. And what I'm going to do is go through all of the chips and see whether or not I can get the machine to boot at 60. And if it doesn't, the only thing really remaining at the end of that that we haven't eliminated is the CPU itself. Well, this is what happens at 180 MHz. The machine actually posts because, of course, it's not running at full speed at this point. And you can see that it says 180 megahertz, no problems, counts up the RAM and then hangs. And this is exactly the behavior with every single one of those RAM chips. So this means that the only reason this machine is not starting at 180 is that the CPU just won't manage it. Now, I wondered about this for a while because some of my viewers claim that almost all of these 5x86 133s run at 180 if you switch the cache off. But I went back to CPU Galaxy's channel and he has some great videos there about overclocking. You really should check those out if you haven't seen them. And I watched very carefully his video about the 5x86 overclocking where he got a record uh, by clocking the thing at 180 megahertz. And he mentioned very explicitly in that video that he went through 30 CPUs, 330, before he got one at 180 megahertz. So I think that explains conclusively why I haven't been able to get 180 megahertz working on any of these boards. Uh, it is just that this CPU isn't going to handle that. So it means that in order to go any further from here, we need to go out and buy a huge number of CPUs. Now, I think there's a little bit of a problem with doing that. It's not really sustainable for all of us YouTubers to go out and buy 30 CPUs looking for that rare one that might run at 180. If we keep all those CPUs, there's a hike in demand and prices go up for everybody. And if we sell off the ones that don't run at 180, then the marketplace is just flooded with CPUs that don't achieve that score. And so I think the responsible thing for us to do is to admire the work of CPU Galaxy. And I've actually put a link to his video in the description. Please check it out if you haven't already. And then for the rest of us to just leave it at that. 
My purpose in this series of videos was actually to compare motherboards and to see how much difference the chipset makes and how much difference the configuration of the board makes. And I think we've learned a heap, including how to get boards to work that are stubborn. Uh, we've learned a great deal about how random it is in terms of RAM and video cards uh, when you're overclocking. You can even have two video cards of exactly the same type and one will work and the other won't. So there's been a lot of interesting things that we've found along the way. But I think it's time to move on now to other more interesting topics now that this one's been covered really quite well. And as you might have guessed, that brings us to the end of our Socket 3 overclocking series. Thanks for all the views over the years on this series and a special thanks to everyone who commented. I love reading your comments and I often find them very informative. But what of our heroes, Jason and Timmy? Well, as legend would have it, the school bullies held off on bullying Jason for a while on account of his sudden bereavement. But they soon resumed swirlies for both him and Timmy for not having the best PC in the school. Of course, after a couple of years, the life insurance policy for Jason's father came through and he was eventually able to afford an Apple. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.